Good morning, everyone, um, and uh, welcome to today's lecture. We're very excited to have Dr. Kenyon Raley here today and tomorrow. This is, as you know, part of our Disparities Awareness Month, which was launched last week with Claudette Shepard, who gave a great talk at uh, OBGYN. And for those who are interested, we have a whole range of additional lectures during the course of the month. So if you go to the GSM website, you can find them um, there posted. Um, Dr. Raley is an associate professor at uh, Duke University and the inaugural director of diversity and inclusion for the Department of Family Medicine. He is by training a family medicine uh, physician. He launched the Cultural Determinants of Health and Health Disparities course at the Duke University School of Medicine, which is unique in that it provides a longitudinal curriculum focused on health disparities and socio-cultural influences on health and well-being. He's locally, regionally, and nationally well-known. Uh, we're thrilled to have him here. He's going to be giving two lectures. Today, is, as you see on the screen, is entitled Care is Primary, a Protocol for Prevention of Bias in Personal, Professional, and Patient Interactions. Tomorrow, during uh, the Dean's first uh, annual Grand Rounds, uh, hosted by the Department of Surgery at 7 a.m., he'll be giving a, a, a talk entitled Hills, Valleys, and Hard Knocks, Healing and Handling Health Disparities with History. And so I hope you can make it. It's at, it is at 7 a.m. when you're probably pre-rounding or rounding, but if you can make some time, that would be great. And we will be recording um, that session as well. So because we have a tight timeline, I'm going to pass the baton to Dr. Raley, and thanks again for coming to Knoxville. I'm going to take this off. Welcome, uh, everyone. For those both in the room and virtually, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, to Dr. Hauptman and, and colleagues. Uh, uh, it's just been a, a great experience so far. I look forward to our time we have together. So I'll jump right in. Looks like the slide is not advancing here. Um, so I won't spend any time on the objectives, but I would like to just start briefly um, with two moments to pause. And the first in his acknowledgement of our past, uh, particularly the physical land we inhabit here in Tennessee, uh, the land inhabited by the Woodlands culture, which eventually led to the Yuchi people and then the Cherokee peoples. And the first moment is really just a moment to acknowledge and honor the people and ancestors that have stewarded this land for many generations. And so, I always like to start with a bit of an acknowledgement there. And the second moment is more of an acknowledgement, I think, of our present. And I would like to ask that we collectively just take a moment, I think, in silence and, and support, sadness to those perhaps that we've already lost in 2021. And uh, unfortunately, those we've lost in 2022. So I, I hope that, that that these two moments will be followed by other moments of uh, listening, learning, and most of all, love for friends, family members, both known and unknown that have suffered and are suffering. So I'll just collectively ask all of us to just take a brief moment. And thank you for that. I have no relevant uh, financial or non-financial disclosures. I also have a disclaimer. I'd like to think of this lecture as a two-part series. And, and so today is really, uh, you know, the second half, although it says part three on the slide. And, and tomorrow's lecture, if you are able to attend or uh, hopefully have access to a recording, is I'd like to think of more of an introductory lecture. So some of the things we'll be discussing here. And I happen to be a bit of a Star Wars fan. So the first movie I saw was Return of the Jedi that got me into, uh, into Star Wars. So think of this as the Return of the Jedi. <laughs> version. Uh, and tomorrow's lecture is really the introduction I'd, I'd like to have. And so all the stuff in between of the meetings and the discussions that I'm so excited to have, my favorite of the three happens to be Empire Strikes Back. So uh, I think the meet is happening in the middle. And so uh, hopefully today, uh, and you're able to pair all of these into a cohesive uh, unit. I always ask as I enter into these discussions to do to have community guidelines. And so you've seen ground rules and presentations, no doubt. And I love uh, this one. And this is Dr. Werner Myers, who has a great TED talk, if you ever have an opportunity to watch it, 
about overcoming biases and walking boldly towards them. And, and what that means really is leaning in. I believe the magic happens outside of your comfort zone. So as we engage in discussions around identity, space, place, I really think we should become more comfortable with the uncomfortable and less comfortable with the too comfortable. So today I'll be bringing up some topics, perhaps for most are not new, um, but maybe in a way that might cause you to reflect a bit. And if you have some discomfort, I want you to just lean into it. So I would just ask you to do that uh, today. And the second directive is accept and expect non-closure. I happen to be a science fiction person. So there's often things throughout my presentations related to science fiction. This is from the movie Avatar. And in the beginning, there's a debriefing, a security debriefing where the main uh, general is talking to everyone about the dangers of the planet Pandora. And what he's saying is, it's my as, as head of security, it's my job to keep you alive. I will not succeed, not with all of you. And not that any lives are being lost today, but as it relates to bias, cultural humility, cultural competency, frankly, there may be people in the room, virtually or physically, that aren't necessarily convinced or they feel that this is not the best use of their time. And I've accepted the fact that one lecture won't do it. I'm not here to convince you of anything. I'm really just here to engage in a conversation. I also firmly believe that as it relates to health disparities, culture, identity, equity, justice, uh, there's a certain amount of messiness and lack of closure that's just gonna happen. And I, I would like to believe I'm gonna do a good job here today, but process really is product. So the process of being involved and whether you listen for five minutes or 50 minutes, I think that's a product we can be proud of, but we're not gonna tie disparities and, and cultural humility up in a nice bow and be done and say, hey, we're all better and we treat our patients uh, amazingly now because I went to a lecture with Dr. Rayleigh. I don't expect that, uh, but I do hope that we can continue conversations. So in that vein, let's start with the story. I think it's ap apropos to this particular group uh, that this is a patient that presents to you uh, for chest pain. And they are describing chest pain like an elephant sitting on their chest. They have a history of hypertension, hyperlipidemia. Uh, their blood pressure is there. As you can see, it's elevated at 155 over 95. The physical examination turns out to be normal. And the EKG has some changes perhaps that suggest something's going on in the history itself. And, and this individual's uh, risk factors are, are concerning to you. And you recommend this patient be, be seen by your amazing cardiology colleagues, and you are concerned about cardiac ischemia. And this patient says to you uh, that uh, they want to go to the other hospital. They don't really want to come uh, to this hospital. And they add that their mother died in this place, and they haven't been impressed. They felt that they were invisible, that no one really explained things to them, and no one really gets me here. Uh, so people where I live talk about this hospital, it really isn't for us. And so do you know what that's like? And, and this patient uh, turns to you, if you can imagine this scenario. So here's the questions that'll start my content is why would the patient refuse this recommendation? Uh, do you have to agree with the patient, their perception of their experience? Uh, and does identity or worldview concordance matter? And ultimately, what does this have to do with bias? And, and why are we here? So. Um, I like to begin with some fundamentals. I'll take you through some facts from my uh, 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 from in this talk, and then towards the end, we'll have some time to go to the fixes. Because I know, as medical providers and clinicians or researchers, we really want to know what to do. Uh, but we'll start with some fundamentals first. And I've got some definitions I want to share with 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 those in the room virtually and, and present with me. So let's start with culture. So what is culture? Uh, I love the analogy of an iceberg, and, and the reason is because oftentimes we think about when we see people, perhaps we look at, uh, you know, what they look like, we see their skin tone or skin color, we hear how they speak, and, and maybe we ascribe some type of identity to that. But the uh, culture to me is all the stuff beneath the surface, and I think all of us would agree that who we are is so much more beyond than what we can see. So there are things that we might assume about ourselves and others, but who we are is beneath the surface. And culture really is the integrated pattern of behavior and identity characteristics beneath the surface. And I would suggest to you that as we navigate people, both patients and peers, that the stuff beneath the surface is really where the magic is. And we as medical providers have an opportunity and I believe a responsibility to get to know those things beneath the surface beyond the statistical data that we see. 
cultural competency was something that evolved really out of some landmark reports uh, in the early 2000s regarding um, disparities in care. And the notion was that cultural competency is something that physicians and medical providers needed in order to improve and enhance disparities. So there was a wave of cultural competency trainings that happened all across uh, academic medicine and other industries. And it really was about teaching people about other cultures, right? And so while a noble intention, I ask you to self-reflect both now and perhaps later, is just being culturally competent or better at getting to know people enough to reduce stigma, disparities, and marginalization. And so uh, cultural competency, while a great intention, may not actually be enough to impact our patients' lives. And so a evolution, I believe, that is an appropriate evolution is this idea of critical consciousness. And so critical consciousness really is based in critical thinking. As an internal medicine provider or any other type of provider, what you do every day is you take information and you synthesize it and you make decisions. And so critical thinking and thinking about differential diagnoses is what I also do in my, in my setting. But critical consciousness is applying critical thinking and cultural humility and putting it together. It moves us away from these understandings of illness that are just based in science. And so the critically thinking and conscious medical provider really recognizes that patients and you don't exist in isolation. There are factors that were involved in them even getting to your clinic or to the hospital, as well as factors involved with you getting there in order to take care of them. And so critical consciousness is more than just understanding and othering people. It's about putting them in context of who they are and the uh, spaces and places around them. And I believe that as a medical provider, we have a responsibility to begin to move more towards critical consciousness and not just the other, understanding what a person from a different place may think or may say that's important perhaps if you're not familiar with that particular culture, but also understanding that individual's uh, history and how they navigate who they are. So, you know, somebody comes in with chest pain, right? Your job is to come up with a treatment. That's what we do most of the, most of the days in addition to many other things nowadays, uh, but ultimately we want a treatment, whether you're a surgeon, whether you're an internal medicine provider, family medicine provider, someone comes with a problem and you want a treatment. And what do we do? Well, we take a history, we ask questions, right? We do diagnoses, diagnostic testing, and we ultimately come to a diagnosis. Is this, you know, costal chondritis? Is this an MI? And so critically conscious medicine is the same, right? You have a problem, bias, disparities, difference. That is a reality in medicine. And we want to end those things. We want patients to have equitable care. We want patients to feel valued. We want people that we work with to feel valued when they and engage with each other. And so we have to similarly take a history. We have to similarly do some analysis. And so critically, uh, critically consciousness, critical consciousness is the stuff in the middle. And part of the time today and other times in your life is doing that analysis. And it's something you have to keep doing over and over. There's various types of uh, isms that impact our patients that we have to be aware of, you know, ableism, racism, uh, homophobia, all these types of things impact our patients, they impact us. And so those fundamental definitions hopefully will allow us to understand that in order to take care of patients, we really have to start thinking more critically, continue to think more critically. Um, and that involves a discussion or another discussion, if it's not your first, about bias. And so I'll spend just a little time, and some of this is review for, for many in this generation, uh, this is part and parcel of their education and others, it's brand new. So I'll break down bias just a little bit and, and we'll, we'll talk about why that's relevant to our case. So I think explicit bias is something, unfortunately, even in our current socio-political environment, we are seeing more examples of. Uh, and so that's a little bit easier to see, right? These are the external things that, that, that we might uh, recognize someone picketing or holding a sign or saying something about a particular group uh, right, and these expressions of, of, of explicit bias are, you know, discrimination, hate speech, microaggressions, macroaggressions, and these are deliberate, right? So um, here's just an example of something that came out last year uh, from a physician assistant in Texas that was for several years, it had a history of perhaps sending some xenophobic and problematic texts 
So this person's biases were on full display, right? Those are easy. We can, we can pinpoint those if someone sends an email or sends a, a message or says something. Um, here's just something I don't have time to show you the video. Uh, if you aren't familiar with the term microaggressions, you can uh, use your favorite search engine and search for microaggressions uh, as mosquito bites. And some individuals, you know, wor wonder about well, this microaggressions, macroaggressions, is this real? And it's less than two minutes watch. So and when you have an opportunity to watch it, if you have some skepticism around the idea of microaggression, I think they do it in a really uh, inclusive way uh, so you can learn what that means. But those are expressions of explicit bias. What's perhaps more sneaky is this idea of unconscious bias or implicit bias, right? These are these attitudes that often happen unconsciously. And they come from you know, human development and they encompass both favorable and unfavorable things. We need, in fact, biases to make decisions. We have to, and in medicine, you have to use data very quickly to make a decision. Oftentimes it is life or death. And, and humans, I believe, have developed in order to make decisions based upon limited information. It's important. In fact, at any one time, there's likely a bunch of cognitive biases that are impacting our decisions. And I'm not gonna go through all of these, but uh, you'll have an opportunity. You can again, search this and I'll provide an, a, a resource list for you to see this and some very interesting things that our brain is doing all the time. And I'm gonna highlight a few of these. I like to think of biases as cognitive shortcuts, right? We have information and then we make decisions. So we, we need to do that as, as humans. If you, you know, hear thunder, you're thinking rain, right? Or does it always rain with thunder? Not necessarily. I like to use the example of, uh, I've been told that if it's late at night at 2 a.m. and there's a dark alley and I see a figure perhaps and I need to go through that alley to get to my car, all the information that I previously had says that's not a good idea, that could potentially be unsafe. The reality is that maybe it's Bill Gates in that, in, that, in that alley, and he's waiting for the next person to walk through to hand them a million dollars. Now, not likely, because that probably would never happen, but maybe it could, or maybe that's just a dream of mine for that to happen. Um, so I make a decision not to go down that alley based upon previous information. So one caveat that I want to make, and this is hot off the press because it just was published in Academic Medicine in December, is as we think about identity, about marginalization, there is some concern that there's been too much of a focus on implicit bias. And in fact, if you do that, you are focusing more on the individuals that perhaps are perpetuating bias and not focusing on the systems in place that support the marginalization. So if you are interested, there's a relatively new article that talks about the fact that various isms, like racism or any other uh, identity group that potentially is marginalized, talking about implicit bias, and that is not synonymous. And so there needs to be a simultaneous focus on the realities that many patients and marginalized populations face. So I just wanted to give that disclaimer that there are limitations to just focusing on awareness. Just telling you that you're biased doesn't necessarily equate to the change in those biases. So um, I told some fundamentals with you and I'm watching my time. Next, we'll share uh, some facts. And two real take homes is that bias is human and bias is in fact here. So let's talk a little bit more about that. And the brain is so amazing, um, but it's also very tricky. So I'm gonna talk to you specifically about how interesting your brain is and how it's working as you listen to me, talk to patients, go about your day. And these are the few topics that I'll just highlight briefly. The first is system one and system two thinking. So our brains are really operating on two systems. Uh, the old model is that bias is bad, like I mentioned, and good people just don't have biases and I treat everybody the same, so let's stop talking about this. Uh, the reality is that that's impossible. Um, and because the way our brains develop and operate, we are in either system one or system two thinking most of the time. System one is this fast, unconscious way of being automatic. You driving into work at this point, you don't have to actively think about it, how you got there, going to the restroom. You know where those things are. You've had one experience, someone told you, it's almost unconscious, right? You just do things. Some of you, the procedures that you do, you've practiced them enough that, you know, it's pretty much automatic. And system one thinking is very, very useful. System two is more effortful. Those decisions that we make where we have to process. 
So everyone is biased and we're operating in between system one or system two. The problem with system one, these automatic associations is that it's very error prone, right? So as we take in information, and make almost unconscious decisions and some conscious decisions based upon automatic preferences, there are many, many errors that can occur. And we're more likely to employ system one when we're tired, stressed, or time limited. And I can tell <laughs> that uh, there are people even uh, likely under the sound of my voice in medicine that have been at some point tired, stressed, or time limited. If you are a medical provider in this day and age, if you are a resident in training, you more likely than not have been tired, stress limit, stressed, or time limited. And in fact, you are likely to rely on your automatic associations even more when that is the case. So these biases exert powerful influences on both how we process information and then ultimately how we recall information. And here is an example. Now I'm hoping individuals on uh, the, the virtual call can hear this. And, and I just want you to listen to this sound and, and you should be able to hear it in the room. What you'll hear is a sentence, a spoken sentence, that's been transformed by a computer to sound like gibberish, so. Any idea what they said? No. Okay, uh, we can hear it one more time. Okay, now we'll hear the real sentence. The Constitution Center is at the next stop. Does it make sense that time? Yeah, wait, was that the same? It was the exact same sentence that you heard the first time. No way. <laughs> it's the exact same sentence. Your brain is always using prior information to make sense of new information coming in. So once you know what the sentence is, when you go back and hear the distorted version, you can apply that information and it makes sense. So from now until the end, <laughs> the last time you close your eyes, you will never be able to unhear that phrase played in gibberish. But for those of you that had never heard it before, it didn't sound like anything until you were told. And what that means what is there's priming that's happening. So you are constantly, what the individual said is that our brains are constantly using information that we are aware of and some that we're not aware of and actually using that information to make decisions. And so biases, believe it or not, the things around us impact us much like that sentence hearing the constitution center is at the next stop you've been primed your entire life to have certain things that you believe it makes sense our brains are really tape recorders that we don't have to actively be thinking i'm remembering this for it to impact us uh so you know uh, i like to use that example of of you know thinking about bias and, and it's close to lunchtime so likely maybe showing you some spaghetti sauce will make you hungry but you are what you ate. So as we think about where did these biases come from? So it's in there. So I'll show you what I mean. I like to think or use the dinner table perhaps as a proxy, at least in my home, where a lot of the values that I learned from my father uh, and my loved ones happen at dinner conversations or lunch conversations, at least for me. And so uh, that's when I learned about manners. That's when I learned stories that my dad would tell me about his day. And I learned a lot of lessons. And many of you, maybe that's your experience, but the reality is that you are what you ate in the sense that throughout your life, you've heard positive things. You've been taught uh, how to respect individuals, other uh, people's opinions. Uh, you can, you've heard messages in your life that were positive messages that hopefully affirmed you or someone taught you how to do something. That has happened, hopefully, for many of us throughout our lives in some way, shape, or form. And those are positive. The reality, though, is that as it relates to priming, there are some of us or many of us that perhaps had an absence of a lesson or two, right? So perhaps there was a person missing that wasn't there to teach us a particular tenet that we learned later in life, or we didn't have an opportunity. Or we frankly heard some problematic messages consistently. And whether or not we adopted that, agreed, we are in fact products of the things that we ate. So you know how certain people are always late, right? Messages you might hear, and you can fill in the blank with whatever you, whatever group you might have heard that. Or I'm so sick of this group of people making excuses. Or you can date whoever you want, but you better not bring home a, those types of realities happen to us as we develop. And we hear messages uh, on television. Uh, we, we see things on television, mind you, and we hear things all the time. Uh, I have three children, and so, uh, you know, we often go to the toy aisle. Think about the last time you went to Target or whatever, 
there's not traditional toy stores anymore. But what are the colors that are often associated with so-called girl toys and boy toys, right? Or the colors in the packaging, these subtle things, is there such thing as a girl toy or a boy toy? There really isn't, it's a toy. But yet we have these subliminal messages that impact us that we have just kind of accepted and we've been primed to believe. So priming is happening all the time. I'll tell you that priming and pattern recognition have impacted medicine and impacted us even in academic medical centers, right? So uh, pattern recognition is something that is looking for patterns and seeing patterns where they don't exist. And once we formulate a theory, we pay more attention and we follow it. Specifically when the academic medicine world, think about things like impacts, USMLE scores, US News and World Report rankings, right? These things that within academic medicine, there's a certain value placed to them. But in reality, there's not a lot of data to suggest that your USMLE score, your MCAT score actually is gonna indicate how good of a provider you're gonna be. I know people that have perfect scores and they couldn't have a conversation if, <laughs> if you wanted to. And people that have failed exams that are amazing providers, right? And likely some people under the sound of my voice. And so within medicine, we've created this culture in a way and we don't have a lot of data to suggest that many of these things that we value actually are valuable. A more realistic and, and perhaps example now around pattern recognition, think about the news media you consume or, or, or you watch. This has, and I'm not talking about any badly about any particular group, but so um, notice how we are primed and the pattern recognition that happens. So what I did was I took a screenshot this morning of the news stories, both on Fox News and CNN. And so just for a moment, if you're able to, and I know it's hard because the, 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 um, the, the image may be small, notice the types of messages that could potentially be sent to you as an individual that looks at CNN versus Fox News and the way that words are very subtly used perhaps to influence you and even your access to information just from the same landing page and both places claim to be fair and balanced, right? And you could get very different stories just from clicking on one website versus the other. And that impacts us. So individuals may have access to information differently that primes them to believe a particular thing. And this is all fair and balanced news, but the story access is very different, right? About how we, uh, we, we get information. So we're primed and you might not notice this if you are being intentional about thinking about how other there are other ways to, to 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 look at media you might not recognize how you are being primed i'll give you an even more example a realer example so this is um a, a screenshot of a website um that was reporting after hurricane katrina and at the top what you're looking at is the words describing uh, an individual that um was in in water getting food and what it says is a young man walks through chest deep flood water after looting a grocery store in New Orleans, right? Now, individuals on the bottom, and you can look at the, the, the you can make some assumptions about the race or ethnicity of the person, looks like a person of color. And the person on the, in the bottom, two residents wade through chest deep water after finding bread and soda from a local grocery store. So quickly, just looking at that, one person looting, other individuals finding, right? And it's very subtle, but if we aren't intentional and start to recognize that we're being primed, in fact, that could reinforce some biases about riots versus protests or, you know, certain groups if we aren't very intentional. So I'm just giving you an example. I, in a way, tricked you. And as you all were listening to the story, who did you picture? What was their gender? Now, my voice was the individual patient. So perhaps you pictured a male, perhaps you pictured a black male, but in fact, there was no information about that individual's race or ethnicity in the case that I began the session with. So in a way you had been primed and your pattern recognition, well, this is someone complaining about the hospital. And perhaps you assumed that this was a man. Look, this uh, description could be a woman saying, I don't feel like I'm seen. Uh, people don't listen to me. So again, it's very subtle. Even me, right? So you noticed if you looked at my title slide. So this is my title slide and, and I'm not here to share any of my, my titles, but just notice my name, right? My name's Kenyon Rayleigh. I actually go by Kenny and, and my pronouns are, are there. If I had 
perhaps led with Kinney. Even something as subtle as our names, we know that there's plenty of evidence to suggest that names impact decisions, resumes, all those types of things. Uh, what if I had listed my pronouns as a they or them? What assumptions or conclusions would you have made about me, right? And perhaps you also noticed that I'm a family medicine physician. What if I said I was a neurosurgeon and I had an MD and PhD? Would your listening of even the content that I'm sharing with you be slightly different because of those notions of value that we place around you know, degrees and certain specialties, right? If I start talking about the brain as a neurosurgeon, is it different than as a family medicine provider? So the reality is that pattern recognition priming are dangerous. They're useful, but they're also dangerous. And there's another thing happening called selective attention. So all of you all take a moment and look at this CT scan. And this is a CT scan of a 50 year old male who had a cough for four months. And I would like you to tell me the most likely diagnosis. So take a moment and look at the CT scan. Hopefully you can see the problem. It's pretty obvious to me as a family medicine provider that often looks at CT scans never. Uh, I just read the report. So hopefully you saw uh, the problem here. And this is cartoon gorilla lung, right? You all see that, that this is the problem right there. So that's the diagnosis <laughs> here on, on this CT scan. Um, and so uh, this actually was a study that was done with a group of radiologists where they asked them to read this chest CT. And this is a, not a knock on my radiology colleague. And it turned out that 20 of 24 radiologists failed to notice the gorilla. And what that means is that our brains work in a way that we can be easily distracted and easily fooled. And so selective attention or inattentional blindness is seeing some things and not others, depending upon where our focus is. And again, not a knock on a radiology colleagues, but me telling you, look at this CT scan, scan closely, you all were in your medicine, likely, well, I wanna get this right. I need to know what this diagnosis is. And likely people, many people missed that gorilla, right? And so that is happening and it's important. And if you think about bias, cultural humility, cultural competency, if we don't actually spend some time to focus our brains on it, it's very easy for us to think, oh, I'm good. I treat people great. I don't see color. I treat everybody the same, right? I'm an open-minded individual. But in fact, if you don't spend a little energy, you are within selective inattention as it relates to these topics, if we're not intentional and careful. So I shared with you facts, fundamentals, facts. Um, the other part of it is bias is in fact here. So that's my second fact that I'll share with you. Uh, and the reality is that discrimination, marginalization is a reality for our patients and ourselves. So this is just a screenshot briefly of a study where uh, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation was asking individuals, they were asking individuals about instances of marginalization discrimination uh, in various settings. And what this is just showing you the take home is that most everyone is experiencing some level of discrimination and bias across identity groups. And yes, some groups more than others in certain instances. So that's the take home is that unfortunately bias discrimination is quite widespread for many identity groups. Within healthcare, there's plenty of evidence to suggest that certain groups consistently are experiencing marginalization, potentially discrimination more than others. And whether or not you agree if it's happening, Perception defines reality. So if these individuals believe they are discriminated against, in fact, they respond and act in ways that may impact, that may result from feelings of discrimination and marginalization. And the real take home from this slide is not to highlight any particular groups suffering more than others. This isn't the discrimination index uh, presentation, right? I'm not trying to say that, well, being this way, it makes it worse. But if you have multiple identities, it does impact you in different ways. So if you happen to be LGBTQ and you are an individual of Native American identity, your potential instances of discrimination go up. And we have to recognize that as medical providers because we are both part of the system, but we are also part of the problem. Bias is in fact here in the hospital and the clinic. And again, there'll be a link to these studies so you can look more closely at them. And this was a study that was done uh, just a few years ago in Virginia, where they were able to show on the right that individuals within medical settings held some potentially false beliefs about certain groups. And this is along racial or ethnic lines, but if you are able to see it, 
or screenshot it. I'll read you a couple of the things on there. And it shows that first year medical students, second year medical students, third year medical students and residents held these false beliefs. So blacks age more slowly than whites and medical students believing somehow that aging is different. There's no evidence to suggest, although you might hear some jokes and things like that. In fact, there is no uh, evidence that somehow people age more slowly. Blacks nerve endings are less sensitive than whites. Whites have larger brains than blacks. Black skin is thicker than whites. Blacks have a more sensitive sense of smell. Now you may be listening to this saying, this is ludicrous, right? This study was done in 1917. How could this be done in 2017? The reality is that the priming and the messages that we've received, unfortunately, even within medicine, these folks are in training right now, right? And if anybody went to the University of Virginia, maybe you filled out this survey several years ago. The reality is that bias is here too, right? Bias is in our notes. Here's a study that talks about stigmatizing language and the transmission of bias in the medical record. And the take home from it was they were able to show that certain words within the medical record impacted a provider's treatment recommendations. So what we say about patients and what we read about patients impacts us. I'll bring it even closer to home. How often have you heard a presentation where someone started with, this 50 year old pleasant patient was coming into the office. Oh, she is just a joy to take care of. She's just so kind. And then you hear a patient, boy, oh, we've got this 50 year old train wreck, frequent flyer coming in, how that impacts you. So the bias is transmitted in how we even talk about patients. One of the, new, oh, there's lots of studies coming out about perhaps taking out race or ethnicity in that first sentence, 50 year old black male, past medical history of hypertension here for hyperlipidemia and chest pain, right? Adding in the so-called race versus if I say 50 year old male, what image comes up into your mind? If I said to you 25 year old patient, uh, no past medical history here for chronic back pain. And I say 25 year old black male, past medical, no past medical history here for chronic back pain automatically because of our associations, our priming, and it's not to pick necessarily an African-American, you can insert anything, right? Female, um, you know, substance abuse user, somebody perhaps when we put former substance abuse or substance abuse was 20 years ago, but somehow it's still on their medical record. And then they come in and ask for a pain medicine. And we're like, well, it said you have substance abuse. That was 20 years ago. They've been clean for 20 years. It has nothing to do with them now. Maybe, maybe not, right? It's so bias is being transmitted in our medical records. I'll also remind you that an absent curriculum is a silent curriculum and bias is happening in our educational programs. And this is just showing you uh, a study about internal medicine residency programs and essentially the absence of this content oftentimes in our programs. Despite us talking a lot about disparities, many programs across the country still haven't got to that point. And this isn't a knock on any particular program, but the reality is that in order to alleviate some of these things, we have to talk about it. And this is just another um, example of a study that you can look at later is that, although this was perceived to be important or is perceived to be important, how are we gonna learn it if we don't actually talk about it, right? If you had to put in a central line and they just say, well, by the time you finish, because you like to do central lines and you're good at central lines, you'll just be able to do it. Well, we have to actually do it in order to, to practice. So cultural humility is something we have to practice, we have to learn about. I would suggest to you, that bias is built into what we do and who we are as medical providers. And so the nature of our training makes us more biased. We teach you information and we teach you risk factors. Patients over 50, men uh, with a past medical history of this are more likely to, but it morphs. It does morph, at least how I trained and where I trained, it morphed. So it became patients with Medicaid, patients with back pain. What about we say about other providers, right? Nurses are, Doctors are like this. What about PAs and MPs? Here's just a fact in my institution, not here, right? Specialty bashing. I'm certain no one has ever heard anyone talk badly about another specialty, right? And unfortunately, that's bias. That's real. So here's just a quick uh, interlude um, of a website that talks about what your socks would look like by medical specialty. And I'm apologizing in advance. This is not me. This is from a website, but it is things that we see. So emergency medicine, it's a sock, but just to be sure, and they're getting scanned, right? Orthopedics, bro, check out my bone socks. What is that saying about people that go into orthopedics, right? Radiology, socks cannot rule out stockings, slippers, 
uh, recommend clinical correlation. How often do we see that? And we're like, oh my gosh, our radiologist colleagues cannot, you know, recommend clinical correlation. Of course, psychiatry, time's up, right? They can't even get the socks together. People that go into psychiatry are just, you know. So I won't, I'll pick on my own on specialty as well. Um, but the reality is that this stuff impacts us and impacts specialty choice. So internal medicine, get comfortable. This is going to take a while. <laughs> you all can relate to that. Family medicine, unable to afford new socks. So, you know, I, I just add that. What's the big deal? Well, you know, I'm running out of time and I want to, uh, I got to, I want to get to the fixes piece, but biases impact our decisions. I hope you leave here knowing that. And they can be very problematic because we're blinded to instances where they're not accurate or they don't align with our expectations. So our decisions are being impacted. It's a big deal and we have to talk about it. We have to think about it. So in these last five minutes or so, I will zoom through the fixes and, and hopefully uh, you these will be useful to you. I just wanna remind you again, awareness is not enough. Awareness is important. Me, you being leaving here convinced that yeah, I'm biased. It's not enough. We have to do some action, but we'll talk about why awareness still matters. I'll zoom through these next few slides to show you that there is evidence to suggest that bias is real. And there's plenty of our articles out there. This isn't just Dr. Rayleigh's opinion. And I don't have a particular agenda other than to improve people care, not just patient care, but peer care, who we are, our residency colleagues, our friends, our loved ones. And there is some evidence, it is mixed, full disclosure about the interventions related to bias. It is mixed. And so we don't have a you know, a smoking gun, so to speak, a magic bullet to fix bias. But there are a few categories that are useful. And I based my fixes in these categories. So the most effective strategies to mitigate bias are um, exposure to counter stereotypical exemplars. So essentially uh, thinking about people that don't fit the, the stereotype or bias intentionally. Identifying yourself with the out group. So having exposures with individuals that don't look like you. Evaluative conditioning is more about, again, being intentional about pairing certain ideas and concepts that potentially could be negative with positive ones so that it reduces the negative thoughts and dealing with emotions actually has been shown to reduce bias. So I warn you, many of these things that I'm gonna talk about in these next few minutes are individual level recommendations. But as I said to you, there are structures in place that just being better at this is not enough. There are things currently that are set up, unfortunately, to, to create difference among people. We have to be honest that, you know, we, we live in a society that separates people um, in many ways. And so I do think though, that the more awareness we have, the more time we reflect and work on ourselves, it does impact the system, but we have to work on the system as well. So what are my fixes? And this is the protocol piece that I'll try my best to get through in these next few minutes. Um, and I've got a few of them and I'll just jump right in. Um, and there's only one slide each for these. So we'll go quickly. Be conscious, be curious, be counterfactual, be culturally minded. You all see that I like alliteration, right? Uh, I, I wrapped myself in, in like a pretzel trying to find words It all started with C. Um, <laughs> so let's start about be conscious. I've already told you that awareness matters. And I would just encourage you to not necessarily go the woke route. I think we've got some problems nowadays with this concept of woke. Um, it's particularly in, in problematic, almost too woke. It's hard to talk to folks that are too woke. I'm not talking about that. I'm just talking about being conscious of your biases and thinking about critical consciousness. And that involves being curious. So curiosity is about an urge to discover and investigate. It moves you beyond statistical facts. So when you meet people or when you see data, you're simply asking questions. So I want to encourage you to be curious about the people you meet, be curious about the decisions they make, be curious about your own decisions. Why do people behave the way that they do? And how do they make that choice individually? I'll remind you that curiosity is about context and context matters. So even as you think about someone's race or ethnic identity, instead of going with what's on the chart, maybe asking the patient, tell me more about your racial ethnic identity. Tell me more about your gender identity. Tell me more about who you love. I put in all of my new patient notes, I asked the patient, what are three important things about you that drive you at this stage in your life? And I actually document those in my chart. And when I see that patient again, I go back and I ask them about it. I say, hey, you told me last time you liked to bowl. When's the last time you went bowling, right? You told me about the band that you're in, because again, it provides context for who they are. 
I use that analogy of the of the iceberg again to say, yes, we see things on the surface, but the stuff beneath the surface really matters. And ultimately, they're individuals. So get to know people in that way. Now, you might not like this suggestion, specifically on internal medicine rounds. I'm going to suggest that you slow them down even more, right? So it's already perhaps long enough. <laughs> I see some folks looking at me sideways. The reality is that when we speed up certain parts, and I'm not saying take more hours to, to figure out these patients. I love internal medicine. I learned how to deeply dive into people and situations on my internal medicine rotation. I valued it greatly. Um, and But in other specialties, potentially, or even within our own rounding system in primary care internal medicine, how often are we not taking the time to get to know the patients and getting the social histories? I know where I train, uh, it would be call a psych consult in order to figure out if a person could actually have capacity. Well, you as a provider can figure that out. You don't need a psychiatrist to tell you that. You can have a discussion with the patient. So I'm just suggesting that you become a social history Sherlock basically, and you just dive deeper than smoking, drinking drugs, who are you married, where do you work? All right, so context matters. I don't have enough time to go into this, but I love Kleiman's questions. The most important question on there is, what do you fear most about your illness? Start adding that to whether a patient comes in for a cold or cancer. Ask them, what do they fear most? I guarantee you, you're gonna get some jam-packed information. A patient says, I know that this is just poison ivy, but this patient, I'm like, why are you in my clinic wasting my time? It's poison ivy, put some hydrocortisone on and go home. That's what I'm thinking. I would never say that, right? But the patient says, well, you know, my dad had skin cancer and my dad and I weren't really close. And so he ended up having a lot of medical problems and that really impacted me. So when I saw this rash, I wanted to come in. And it took five seconds to ask them, what do you fear most about this simple rash, right? So context matters. I want you to explore context. And that means looking beneath the surface. All of us have patients that we know rub us a certain way. Right. I just use the example of fibromyalgia because I struggled with that as a primary care provider in patients with chronic pain. And I had to be intentionally start to seek out opportunities to learn more about these patients so that I didn't put them in a bucket that they were somehow had all of these mental health problems. Right. And so asking questions beneath the surface is what I would suggest. The same thing for chest pain, the same thing for your uh, patients uh, that have diabetes. Get to know who cooks for them. Where do they live? Do they have access to a gym? What stresses them out? Where do they work? Take time to do that. One person sees boat, another person sees land. And privilege is basically being able to say, well, you, I didn't go through that, so therefore it's not real. Think about microaggressions, the concept of microaggressions, right? People are like, that can't be real, what do you mean? Well, in a way, if we aren't careful, we can invalidate people by saying, just because I didn't experience it doesn't make it, doesn't make it so. So I'm encouraging you to have curiosity and have perspective taking. And that's about being wrong. You need to be wrong more. In medicine, no doubt you have met some overconfident individuals, perhaps too many overconfident individuals and overconfidence can lead to mistakes. And so if you're asking yourself, are you biased? I'll show you briefly. Um, and can I stop at 1225? Is that fine? Um, and so um, here's a study where they asked cardiologists and not to pick on cardiologists, this was done in 2005, but they asked them, do people receive different care based upon race or ethnicity? What do you think? And so about 34% of the cardiologists said yes. And I think nowadays more people would agree that this is real. So this is, you know, 15 years ago. So about 30%, 30 to 35% say, yeah, it happens. But then they asked them, well, what about your hospital? Do people get treated differently based upon race or ethnicity? What do you think happened to the number? Goes down, right? Everyone's like, well, yeah, it happens, but not here. And then they asked them, well, what about you? Do you treat patients differently? What do you think happened to the number? Of course, everyone's like, well, yeah, it happens. It might happen here, but it definitely ain't me. <laughs> and so I'm telling you, yes, you are biased, despite, in spite of, or despite your identity, even if you've experienced marginalization, all of us think, me as a man of color, I, I am biased, I treat people poorly, I do it, we all do it. So you're biased. And one of the ways that you can think about bias is the implicit association test. If you haven't taken one, I encourage you. Um, so be wrong more. I want you to be a culturally minded communicator. And the takeaway from this slide, and you'll have access to these definitely because I'm zooming through at the end here just to, to, to be more respectful of your time, is that poor communication impacts outcomes. And if we aren't culturally minded, meaning if we aren't careful about the stuff beneath the surface, we actually make mistakes, it just makes sense. If you don't get all the information from a patient about their complaint, you can't formulate the best differential diagnosis. So you have to get good at communication, which enhances your ability to diagnose and treat 
and it also enhances your ability to connect with your patients and them trust you. So communication matters, our words matter. Um, here's an article that recently came out in the uh, Journal of uh, General, uh, I'm sorry, the Graduate Medical Education Journal about words being as windows and language matters. So all I want you to do is to continually think about the words that we say and use to each other and to our patients. Be a connector. And what this is about is thinking about who's missing from your circle. And I mean authentic relationships, because that impacts us. The more exposure that you have to people that don't think and look like you, the better off you are to being able to engage with people that don't look and think like you, which is everyone. So you might as well spend some time having authentic relationships with people that don't um, look like you and think like you. I want you to be consistent. And what that means is one lecture won't do it. Now, I think I'm doing a decent job. I'm going a little bit over time, unfortunately, but this is not enough. You have to stretch your brain. Now, I'm preaching to the choir for some of you, right? I know that. But perfect practice makes, as my friend Yoda says, right? We have to keep thinking about bias and talking about bias. We do, or we'll fall back into our natural instincts. So last, I'd like to recommend that you be careful. And I was careful in creating that to be clever. And what I mean is to answer the question, does concordance matter? It turns out that it really doesn't. So you don't have to be of the same identity of an individual in order to relate and connect with them. So there's lots of studies to show that what really matters is communication. So you don't have to be a person of color in order to connect with a person of color that believes that their race has impacted their care. If they say to you, I think that people are treating me poorly because I'm this. You don't have to be that or even agree in order to connect with that patient. So connection is what really matters. So care is more than cure. And connection is about empathy. And empathy is about perspective taking and staying out of judgment and really just putting yourself in someone else's shoes. So rarely what you say matters, connection really matters. There's a clip I'd love to show you, or I want you to look at by Brene Brown. It's really short about empathy. Please just look at it. It talks about the difference between empathy and sympathy and what empathy really is for your patient. So if someone says, well, I got treated bad because I was this. You don't have to be that in order to connect with them. So here are some things you could say. I'm sorry that happened. Tell me more. You know, I've never experienced that. I can see that must be difficult. This is just human stuff. Somebody says their loved one dies. You say, I'm sorry. You've been conditioned to say, I'm sorry to hear that. You can do that as it relates to identity. You know, I'm not this and I've never had that lived experience, but I'd love for you to tell me how I can integrate that into your care, right? And if you do that with patients that you don't have concordance with, you're gonna, in a way, begin to connect in very powerful ways. Not once in my 15 years as a doctor has someone, when I gave them a prescription, said to me, wait a minute, what'd you get on your MCAT? <laughs> what was your USMLE score? What school did you go to? Now I'm from St. Louis and I didn't go to Washington University. I went to St. Louis University. People, oh, you went, I say I'm from St. Louis. Like, oh, you went to Washington? I'm like, no, I went to the other medical school. <laughs> um, no one ever cares. What they care about is how I treat them. So this is a quote that you might've been seen before. I've learned that people will forget what you said. People will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. And as medical providers, whether you're in the hospital in the outpatient setting, you're a specialist, proceduralist, the reality is that we can connect with patients and you have to work at it. So apologize for going a little bit over. I recognize you all have other talks, but that's my talk. Thank you. That was uh, absolutely tremendous and uh, makes me think of uh, two quick vignettes. Um, one is uh, what Bill Walton said about minor surgery. So Bill Walton was the great MBA center who had a lot of uh, orthopedic problems over the years. And he said, a minor surgery is something that happens to someone else. And you could just know the provider going, you know, this is not much of anything. It's just a minor surgery. Um, and, and, you know, I thought that was a powerful point. The other thing is like, we use language to say, oh, I've got a really interesting case for you. Mm -hmm. But, you know, there's a human being on the other side of yeah. that case. Yeah. And I think that your analogy of the, of the iceberg is, is absolutely perfect. And it, it makes our jobs also more fulfilling and fun that we're, we're actually connecting on a human level. So tremendous talk, very uh, powerful. And uh, I'm sure the next speaker will give you some leeway for running over a little bit. Are there any questions from anybody, uh, either virtually or here in the audience?
And I can make, and I created a worksheet. I think, I don't know if it got pasted in the chat uh, for people to have access to the references because I knew I flew by some of them. Um, but I can get that to an email to anybody that needs it as well. And just to remind everybody, we've constructed a word cloud. You can still go to the website and uh, fill in what, you know, what health equity means to you, what disparities means to you. And uh, we really would love to have everyone's participation in that. And then we'll probably ask you to do it again at the end of January. Terrific. Thank you so Thank much. You.